Welcome to MindVine, a mental health podcast for everyone. Since our first episode in 2016, we have been sharing stories of recovery, engaging with experts, and tackling the stigma associated with mental illness. The MindVine podcast is produced by Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Sciences and is available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Welcome to the MindVine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers and I'm your host. And today is a very interesting episode of our podcast. As we develop the content for the show and look for stories and expertise around mental health, uh, it kind of takes us all over the place. We've interviewed uh, people with lived experience uh, throughout Canada, United States, and have had guests um, from all walks of life. And one of the ways we do that is just by scanning the globe, which is the internet and looking for people that are sharing unique stories. And um, one area where we've always kind of struggled to get um, a perspective is in the first responder space. Uh, It's still very much an area where people aren't sharing their stories. And when somebody does, it often makes uh, waves. And in this case, I found a story that was making waves in Sudbury, Ontario and beyond. Uh, who I happen to have a uh, somewhat of a personal connection with. Um, I'm going to bring on uh, Constable James Jefferson of the Greater uh, Sudbury Regional Police and welcome him to the podcast. Welcome, James. Thank you. I'm uh, thrilled to be here. So James uh, is a little bit younger than me, but we did go to the same high school. He was my catcher for one year in senior baseball, which I'm sure was as uh, traumatic of experience as uh, <laughs> you can picture back then. But um, I haven't seen you in over 20 years. Uh, I read your story. Uh, obviously, parts of it are very heartbreaking, which we'll get into. But uh, it's great to see you, and I'm glad you're doing doing well today. I truly appreciate that. Yeah. So let's let, like let's get into your story. Um, you know, maybe t- talk us through. Um, becoming a police officer and those, uh, you know, your life at, at that period of time and, and when you kind of encountered, uh, you, you know, your first experience, you know, with what became a mental health issue. Well, policing for me was always number one priority. It was where I wanted to go in life and I was really pulled to the profession. I, I saw no other avenue for myself. Um, and really getting into the profession 14 years ago, I loved every second of it. It was such an organic fit where you just feel everything is right. All the stars are aligned and you're just where you're supposed to be. And the profession is beautiful. Everything about it, I thrived in it. I thrived in helping people. I thrived on doing good community work and really trying to make a change in the policing culture and community. Um, And I figured my career would have just continued on that trajectory of positivity and elevation and promotion. And it wasn't until about the two year mark where, you know, I really had an experience that was life altering. Um, It was a very traumatic experience for me. It was a fatal shooting that really came at us fast. Um, It was December 29th, 2010. And we were working a night shift, my partner and I, and we were the only car available at the time. And we had a homicide in progress that we responded to. And when we arrived at the apartment, we saw the homicide did occur. And the person responsible for this made that fateful choice to come at my partner and I with the knife that he had used. And we were really at a point of no return or retreat. Uh, We were stuck. And it was a terrifying situation to be in. I think a lot in life we get desensitized by true lethal threats because we see it in media, we see it on the news, but the reality of it, even as a police officer is terrifying. And being in that, that situation of life or death, we had no choice and we had to open fire to save our own lives. Um, And taking a life was something I wasn't prepared for. I believed that I would be fine. I believe that I would wear this, you know, metaphorical mask of strength and and just be strong and it would all pass like the changing season. But I found very early on that, you know, remnants of PTSD started really to trickle within me. And the more and more I suppressed it, the stronger it became. And 
it was very shortly later on after the shooting, I had my first child, which was for any new parent, a stressful endeavor in itself. And I was promoted shortly after that into our drug unit as a detective. Um, so my life was changing rapidly after this experience. And I really didn't get a chance to slow down and catch my breath. I had that mentality, which a lot of police officers do that, you know what, I'm just going to bury it and keep moving because I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be labeled and I want to be promoted. Being a drug officer, being an undercover officer, that is what I wanted to do. And I was going to move heaven and hell to, to get there. Um, so I found myself in a very, very uh, tricky situation because my career was progressing at a rapid rate. I was very successful in what I was doing. But behind those scenes, in the dark, I was suffering immensely. And I didn't know what I was suffering from. I never experienced depression or anxiety or all that symptomology that, that PTSD brings. And I was really trying to play catch up and trying to interpret what I was going through alone. And what a scary situation to be in. And I can't imagine even that, you know, 2010 doesn't really sound that uh, long ago, but in reality, you know, it's more than a decade. And what was the, what was your experience with mental health on the force at that point? Like, was it a topic of conversation? Like, could you, you know, you mentioned that you couldn't necessarily identify what you were going through, but was it uh, discussed as a, an, an issue that you needed to be um, cognizant of as you were going through these kind of uh, interactions? At that point in time, there was literally nothing. Mental health was not at the forefront of policing. PTSD was not being discussed. It was truly being hidden. Um, and it wasn't until about 2015 that my service started to adopt the PTSD prevention plan, which I believe a lot of services, it was, it was legislative that they had to adopt it. And we started that conversation. But even when I, I participated in the training and kind, kind of understanding where I'm at and PTSD was starting to become a reality for me, it didn't hit home. It missed the mark so far that I sat there and I said, they're not telling my story. It's not speaking to me. And I should be one of the people that, that this education should be speaking to. When I read, uh, you know, your account of your, uh, your PTSD journey, you know, you talk about um, how you coped. And you coped in a lot of ways that a lot of people with PTSD do, right? Uh, you, you know, were using drugs, alcohol. Uh, the part that I don't know that I've heard before was um, your, I guess, the high risk behavior that you were engaging in uh, on the job. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about uh, that and, and like why you gravitated towards like um, some of those high risk situations. Well, it, it's that adrenaline rush because you're so numb and anything you can do to feel something, it's, it's just euphoric. And if you're not numb, it's all the negative emotions that PTSD brings. So when I was engaging in these high risk behaviors, I was pursuing undercover work as hard as I could. I was very adamant. This is what I wanted to do. And I knew it was the wrong choice, but I, I had the devil on one shoulder, the angel on the other telling me which way to go. And when I started working, when you're good at what you do, people will overlook the risky behavior. I was going out, I was making arrests by myself with no backup, no radio. I was putting myself in very dangerous situations doing undercover work in my own city, which obviously contributed immensely to my hypervigilance in my off time. Um, and really with a complete disregard for the result on what would happen to me. I was going in houses where I didn't know who I was going to see. My backup was far away with, you know, really uh, thrown together contingency plans for my safety. And it didn't bother me at all because anytime I immerse myself in this danger, it was a feeling of strength. It was a feeling of control. And I had none of that in any other aspect of my life. So it was throwing myself just to get these rushes, just to be able to feel something because the vast majority of the time it was numbness or it was negativity. 
you eventually reached a point where um, like you contemplated suicide. Um, and in the piece that I read, um, you, you know, cite your daughter as your motivation, you know, to not follow through with that. Um, can you take us through right, what led up to that? And, uh, you know, even like how, you know, where you were at in terms of like post event, right? Like you're talking about years after this happened and you're, um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're coping on your own and, and dealing with in your own way. And like what eventually led you to reach out for like, to, I mean, to stop white knuckling it and do it on your own. Like what, what led to that? Well, really it's, it's the rock bottom in my opinion. It was years of that steady decline and I was losing everything. My marriage was beginning to fail. My, I was hiding more and more in my personal time. I was hiding on the job. I was really, I was suffering in plain sight um, and thinking about suicide every day. It, it never left my mind. And it, and it wasn't the fact that I wanted to die, but it was the fact that I believed that I would never be able to escape this pain, this weight on my shoulders every morning I woke up. It was there waiting for me. And I thought it was the be-all of end-all of who I was. I truly did. And coming to that, that pinnacle point of I'm going to take my life. Terrifying place to be. And, and I remember it very vividly sitting in my, in my plainclothes car. We were on surveillance, sitting there in tears in the dark on a cold Sudbury night. And that was it. I, I could not take it anymore. And, and my only option was to take my life. And to unload my gun and put it to my head, squeeze the trigger just to prime myself and then load it and sitting there with my finger on the trigger and tears rolling down my face. And thankfully, in that moment, I, I could not escape the vision of my daughter. And I refer to her as my angel because she saved my life. She really did. Because I could not fathom putting any trauma onto her. And I know that would be inevitable. She would always be, she would always be faced to, you know, accept the fact that her father took his own life and he's no longer here. And she will always bear that heartache. And I had to sit there contemplating, am I going to endure so she didn't have to, or am I going to take the easy way out and then put this onus on her? And as I sat there, it was a light switch. Something clicked in me and I made that ultimate choice that I could not do this. I didn't care how bad the PTSD got. I didn't care how much I had to suffer because there was no way on this earth I was going to put my daughter through this. And she was the catalyst. And despite, you know, even the fact that I made that choice, I didn't get any better. It was years after still trying to maintain and tread water. But the fact that she was the only light I had in my life, everything else seemed dark. And when I looked at her, I had that glimmer. So there was hope. But it wasn't until truly that my wife and I said, okay, we can't do this anymore. You know, we, divorce was in the talks, separation was on the table. My work, I was off work for a number of years when I finally crashed. And I was heavily addicted to medical cannabis. I was drinking excessively, couldn't leave my own house due to the anxiety. And depression was just so immense that I hated life and I hated myself. But living like that for a duration, you get perspective on, you know, where you want to go. And, and I'm a firm believer that rock bottom is a beautiful place because there's collateral beauty there where there's only one way to go but up. That is your only option. And I began to hate the PTS journey so much that I no longer tolerated in my life. And I made that choice that I was going to heal no matter what. I didn't care if I, what I had to do, what hoops I had to jump through. I was willing to try anything and everything and endure the pain of progression because it meant more to me than the pain of PTSD. A lot of people, whether it's PTSD or another mental health issue, um, very seldom does the first thing work or the first time you reach out for help, then that's the solution. Um, sometimes, you know, medication works for people. Uh, generally, it's a combination of the two. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, therapy. What was it uh, for you that made the biggest difference in your life? 
it was a multitude of things. Um, I could say just physical fitness uh, was 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 keeping my head above water. That was my one and only um, self care at the time. But as I embarked on the journey of healing, I really had to you know be introspective with how I ticked and what worked for me. Um, at the time, I was in therapy. I, I was in therapy for years after the shooting, and I never got better. But I, I never understood that the psychologist that I was with didn't challenge me. He, he didn't make me speak about my trauma and, and really delve within it and, and embrace it because the only way out is in. And he never pushed me to go into that dark place and really become friends with it and understand it. So it was, you know, detaching from that relationship and really seeking a doctor that had the skill set with first responders, with PTSD, and really wouldn't let me dictate my own therapy. Because, you know, if you dictate your own therapy, you'll keep yourself safe, whether you, you know, really make a conscious decision to or not. But she pushed me and it was finding the right therapist. It was reaching out to a chaplain who I didn't think it would do anything for me. I did it at, at the advice of my doctor and it was a, a beautiful experience. It was a one off conversation that I still hold with me today because it was just so impactful. And, you know, one of the things that uh, the chaplain, who's now an archbishop, what she had said to me was, I'm going to pray for your forgiveness. But she said, not, not your forgiveness from God, but your ability to forgive yourself. And that really stuck with me. And then aside from that, it was being aware and cognizant of all my daily habits and rituals, right? It was right from the music I listened to, to getting, getting rid of all the depressing, angry music, to being, you know, what am I watching to uh, really immersing myself in, in public speakers like, you know, Tony Robbins, Eric Thomas, really motivational people that, that spoke about progression and it was surrounding myself with good people. And I think the main aspect that really brought me out of the trauma was conducting my own exposures and, that it was extremely difficult. It, it was a painstaking process and I did it by myself, but exposing myself day after day to systematic desensitization, to getting used to people and getting used to life and learning that, you know, my mind doesn't have my best interests at heart. My mind is always worst case scenario. Something bad is going to happen. And I had to really teach myself that life is beautiful and you know what, there's not danger lurking around every corner. And I had to really, you know, change the way I thought, my perspective, and my neural pathways to really, you know, grasp the, what life is all about and how to live it. I wonder, you know, obviously, you know, you're experienced police officer, you know, I've never, I, I don't have that experience, but from the outside looking in, it, it looks like it's still a very much a, like it's a team environment, I would think. Um, you know, like I, I know, if, you know, your background, obviously I mentioned baseball, but you were, you know, a university basketball player, um, played team sports your whole life. You go on to a profession where, you know, you rely, you know, I think in your piece, you call them your brothers and sisters, there's that close bond. And in that environment, it would appear to me to be really difficult to talk about self-care or to put yourself first, because it goes against all the principles of you know, team sports, uh, you know, that brotherhood. Um, was that a difficult thing for you to get over the need to like take care of yourself and maybe the idea that, you know, somehow, some way that's selfish and, and put it, you know, that maybe we tell ourselves, you know, that, that, that's selfish. You know, it, it was a real eye opener on how much of a prior priority we have to make ourselves. Um, and it, it really showed me the fact that I didn't make myself a priority for a very long time because of those stigmas. I put my profession, I put my promotion, I put my reputation ahead of myself every single day. I put on that badge and went out to police. And it wasn't until I started working the role I'm in now and, and really talking about what I went through. It really showed me that this is what people need. Because every time I spoke, every time I told my story, and that was one of the biggest priorities I had coming back and after healing, 
was that raw and transparentness of what I went through because I'm not the only police officer and first responder going through it. There are so many suffering in silence. But speaking about it showed me how much of a ripple effect it has. And once someone starts talking about that, you give permission to everybody that it's okay not to be okay because I've learned in this profession, it's 30 years long, but the mind isn't wired for 30 years of trauma. It truly isn't. So we have to really make a conscious effort to take care of ourselves because in my opinion, this is the hardest job in the world. There's never been more pressure on police officers than there is today. And, and we've never been more scrutinized. So you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not taking care of yourself because you know what I tell officers is, you know, career is 30 years, life is a lot longer. And you don't want to work this 30 years to really go in the twilight of your life and suffer. You mentioned, you know, the work you're doing now. Um, I think your official title is like wellness coordinator. Um, and it sounded like, you know, maybe just talk about how that position started. Because it sounded like you had a lot of influence in even creating that position, or at least some of the priorities of it. So how did you come about being into the position you're in now? And, and what, what is it that you do? Well, really, the stars aligned for me. Um, I was off work for three and a half years. Uh, the two years was when I spent in, in pure chaos, and then I spent a full year on recovery. And after I recovered, I, I really had to do some soul searching in what I wanted to do. Um, I was a believer that if I went back to the road, I didn't know if that was the best choice for me at the time. And I knew with what I experienced, it was invaluable. I always felt that I was going through PTSD for a reason, and I, and I was going to use it in some way, shape, or form. I always believed that. I didn't know how, and it wasn't until I fully healed that I had that apparition of this is it. This is what I have to do, and I have to help police officers. And I remember talking to WSIB and, and telling them, you know, I want to work in mental health. I want to work with first responders, and I want to help people. And it was almost amusing because, well, you're just a police officer. You have no mental health credentials. How are you going to do this? And then I just I had this vision of what I could create, and it was me literally the first time in three and a half years walking into the station and going right to the chief's office. And I had my ducks in a row. I, I had all my notes. I had points and I pitched them. I had all the shortcomings and all the pitfalls of where we were losing our people. And I had the experience in so many aspects of where the ball was dropped with me and where I had no support. And I believe that I could fill in those gaps. And it was imperative that we had someone watching out for our people. Because, you know, we need someone to help the helpers. And when I explain this to the chief, you know, he laughs about it still because I was so determined. Like he could tell that I had no other, no other um, option. This was it. And it was an hour meeting. And right after the meeting, he gave me the green light. It, it happened that fast. Um, and it was a few months of, you know, doing some courses and getting some training and then, the, then I was off and running. And so what I do now, a multitude of things really, um, but it's, it's holistic and organic healing. It's from physical fitness to nutrition, to mental health, to peer support, to providing exposures and helping with exposures with members returning to work. And, and really just being that soundboard of someone who's gone through it. And I can tell you the sights and the smells and the sounds of depression and anxiety and all of that mental health challenge. And I can walk someone in that path. And I think that's the biggest takeaway that, that we miss the mark in a lot of ways. And if I had someone leading me early on, I think I would have had a very different career path. But essentially, that's what I am. I'm, I'm here as a guide that anyone going through struggle, I'm going to make sure they're set up. I'm going to make sure they have the right therapy. I'm going to make sure they're doing the right things and get them out of the house. Don't let them insulate themselves and, and shut themselves off from life, right? It's going to hurt. And I'm very honest and open about that, that progression hurts. We seem to think that it's this sunshine and rainbows, but it's, it's deep and dark and it's soul wrenching. Uh, but that's what I've done. And I've seen some amazing success stories. I've started with some people that reminded me exactly of who I was when I was on that rock bottom floor and they're back to work. They're functioning, they're happy and they're smiling and it works. It truly works. I would imagine 
you would be in the, in terms of age and experience, you'd probably be right in the middle of um, the workforce in Sudbury. Um, you know, people with a lot more experience than you, uh, obviously people with a lot less. Uh, when you, and I, you know, just assuming that you see people of various uh, levels of experience that come through your door, are there expectations uh, or is the stigma associated with mental health the same for maybe the younger, uh, more inexperienced officers that are coming in? Like, are they more comfortable talking about mental health than maybe people like your age and a little bit older? Or is like, have you seen anything like that? Well, you can clearly see a changing of the guard. It's, it's very apparent with, you know, the, the veteran officers that, yes, there are some who don't believe in mental health. There are some who don't believe PTSD exists. It's, it's that easy to suck it up and smile and think positive. Um, and unfortunately, some of these are, are leaders in organizations who think this. Um, however, there are leaders who, who do believe in it and do support their people. And, but with the younger people, you know, as soon as they get on, you know, with onboarding and orientation, you know, I'm inoculating them. I am telling my story before they even go to police college. They are getting a taste of what is possible in this career in terms of mental health and how much of a decline you can have if you don't take care of yourself. And then I meet with them when they get back from police college and I ensure that they have all the resources and supports. They know where to go and they feel comfortable that they have a start point. And I think that's the biggest thing that, you know, when people go through trauma and challenges with mental health, where do I start? And it's completely overwhelming. But if you have, you know, a very comfortable start point in myself, then it's it's very easy decision to make. I can just go to James, have a conversation because he'll understand me because I've heard his story and he's very open and honest. And it's that ripple effect that I spoke about before. It, it really does change people. And it really does change people's belief and perspective on asking for help. You know, as you're answering that, you know, because I know a little bit about you, you know, I think about, um, you know, you being a, a standout athlete, you know, both, you know, well, most of your life and maybe some of the, you know, even the stigma associated with that, right? Like, how could this guy have any issues? Like, you know, he's got it all or whatever the case may be. And then your so your story is everywhere. And, and I, and I will say like, you don't just tell your story. <laughs> you, um, you leave nothing to the imagination of your story. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's completely honest and raw and uncomfortable, uh, at times when people in your life, um, whether it's people at work or even in your personal life, um, come across your story and, you know, see you again for the first time. Is it something that they talk to you about? Like, what's the reaction, you know, among the people around you about, you know, what you're doing with your, with your lived experience? There's a, there's mixed reactions. Um, some, some people close to my family still can't listen to me talk. They can't listen to my story. It hurts them quite a bit, uh, especially hearing about suicide. Um, and then some people it's, it's pride. It's, it's beauty. It's, you know, we're, we're doing good right? We're, we're starting that conversation and it's, and it's so needed today, you know, regardless if you're a first responder or just a civilian, we all have a story and we're all going through life and, and part of life is suffering. And, and to accept that and to know how to deal with that, I think is an important lesson and we all need to learn it. Um, so I, you know, it, it's, I've, I've been applauded and, and what really stood out in me the most was when I got back to work, and the first thing I did, I went to every lineup and I told my story over and over and over. And I would see officers sitting in lineup in full uniform in tears. And then I would out, have officers follow me out of the lineup room right to my office and saying, everything you said, I'm going through now. What do I do? And you see that, you know, they are clamoring for someone to say they can feel this. They want permission and they want to feel it's okay because just like I did, I felt I couldn't say I'm not, I, I couldn't say I'm suffering. I'm wearing this uniform. I'm a police officer. I'm in this macho profession. I'm an athlete. I'm supposed to not feel all of this. I'm supposed to be strong, but strength is, is it, it, and what I tell people is it's much easier to suppress than it is to talk about it. And you think suppression is the strong road, but suppression works until it doesn't. Talking about it is hard. 
being vulnerable with yourself is hard. And that's what we have to learn. You know, what's great about your story is um, that you're not the only story out there. You know, there, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'd say there is a shortage of people uh, who are first responders who are sharing their story. I, I don't think there's any question about that, but, but you are not, you're not the only police officer who's out there talking about their mental health experience. So there is, you know, some momentum in terms of uh, identifying it as a priority in the, in your profession, you know, with your experience uh, in the, in your current role, and obviously like your, your mental health journey, like what would you like to see police forces um, in Ontario, Canada, wherever, uh, what would you like to see them do to, to protect their officers? Really? There's, in my opinion, there's, there's a few things. Um, one, Supervisors. I think supervisors are the biggest catalyst to create change. Um, they're watching over their people and supervisors need to be able to identify when someone's gone to a difficult call, when the calls affected them, and they need to understand how to reach out in the right way because they have that authority. It's a very delicate balance. Um, but supervisors need to realize that they're not just there to check boxes and, and check reports. They're there to watch over their people because they are the, the all seeing eye of their platoon or their unit. So they have to be able to identify when someone's struggling because most of the time people won't identify it themselves or they won't admit it. You know, secondly, there's so much emphasis put on prevention and you, you can, you know, give as much mental health training as you can. And obviously starting off when someone comes into the profession to really be candid about mental health and make it okay to talk about it, but ultimately, we can't predict what someone's going to go through in this career. We don't know how someone's truly wired, and we don't know what is going to you know, bring someone out of alignment and have them suffer. So I'm a firm believer that you know, a lot of resources need to be put into recovery and reintegration. Because in a lot of ways, we have people returning to work, sometimes unhealthy. Sometimes they return too fast, or sometimes they return to a role that maybe they're not ready for and to create systems of exposures and supports. I know, you know Edmonton Police has a, a brilliant reintegration model that they started in 2015, and they overturned their culture. They overturned their people going off work, and they expedited people returning. And you know having that in place in policing organizations and having reintegration officers, which we are starting to see, you're starting to see services adopt this approach because it's inevitable that people are going to go off. If you preach mental health, you preach honesty, people are going to need to step away from the job from time to time because we're human beings truly working an inhumane job at times and what we see and experience. So to have resources set there and have people being taken care of, because if you have someone going off work, if they're under the WS of the umbrella, their only obligation truly is to be in treatment and to therapy. But that could be once a month. So you got to see how, how people, you know, if, if you're in treatment once a month, there's a lot more time to play with, to implement some structure, have them, you know, coming into the station, having them come in and exercising, things like that, that are not complicated, but they're supportive and it keeps them, you know, that sense of normality. And, and it creates the fact that you're not going to create triggers in your own organizations, in your own buildings, in your own profession. Um, those are the biggest takeaways I see. And, and really just having, you know, a good solid peer support team, and then having that start point, I think that is imperative because, you know, like I said earlier, most officers, they'll wait until their life is in chaos until they reach out for help. But if you don't have a start point, it's so overwhelming. What doctor do I use? What treatment do I go in? And there are so many different treatment modalities that work for people. You know, you look at bio neurofeedback, you look at rapid eye movement, you look at CBT. Some things worked for me, some things didn't. And people need to understand, you know, the ebbs and flows and the peaks and valleys of this process because that's what it is. You're going to fail a lot of times in what you do, but that is the process. you got to know what works for you and what doesn't. Just getting back to your, your current role uh, for a second, um, just because, you know, you're talking about like managing your mental health, which it sounds like you're doing uh, – really well, but I would imagine, you know, it's not something you're, you're cured from. Uh, it's something you have to manage, you, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, understanding yourself. And 
does your current position in, sh in sharing your story and working with police officers who are struggling, does that help you like uh, in terms of managing your health? Like, does that help you stay accountable to your own health or how does that impact, you know, your own personal um, journey? Well, with, with this role compared to, you know, a drug detective and a uniform officer, I'm very aware that I, I've never had to make it more of a priority to be in tune with how I'm thinking and feeling. And I got to check in myself, check in on myself multiple times a day because I am constantly taking in people's traumas and I am their soundboard and I am sometimes their lone support. I've had officers, you know, call me just leaving the train yard, stepping off the tracks. I've had officers, if I had a gun right now, I would kill myself. I've dealt with suicidality in officers. So to take all that in and not make myself a priority, it's, it's inevitable that I'll crash and burn. Um, so I really, really have to be in tune with how this work is affecting me and really to make it a priority to decompress, make it a priority to be open and honest if you know I'm feeling a certain kind of way and to understand my outlets on who I have to talk to and, and, and open up to. And, but really, I believe that in the process that I've been in, I've really solidified myself in terms of giving myself a great base in all my, you know, habits and rituals and self-care and self-talk that, you know, I do feel some lulls in, in taking in other people's trauma, but on one level, it's cathartic, it's purposeful because I, I can see people, you know, rising from the ashes, so to speak. Uh, and see them live again, but it's it's a difficult it's difficult work, especially when I look at, you know, when you look at psychologists and counselors, you know, when that hour session is done, it's okay. I'll see you next week, or I'll see you in two weeks. For myself, it could be a three hour talk with someone crying the entire time, and then you know hours of a text conversation leading through the night, or sitting beside my wife while someone's talking about suicide at night, sitting on the couch watching television. Um, so it's, it's, I can never really get away from it. And it's, I have to make it a priority to at times cut ties and, and really decompress from it. Um, but ultimately this is my calling. And I, I truly believe that. And if you live your calling, regardless on how challenging it is, it's not work. It is, it's bliss. And it, it's, it's a funny word to use bliss in terms of you know, trauma and, and talking about these raw aspects of life and, and mental health, but I know what I'm doing and I know I'm doing good. And I, I take full solace in that. So you mentioned your wife and I, I know you have um, young kids as well. How do you incorporate mental health uh, into your, you know, your family life and how you're raising your kids? And I, I asked that in like the context of you know, probably the lack of conversations we had growing up about mental health and, and, and how, you know, with your lived experience and, and how do you, you know, when you're so out there too, right? That's another consideration you have to have. Maybe your kids are a little too young, but eventually they're going to find your story online. Um, so how do you, how do you manage or how do you plan to manage, you know, what your, you know, your journey is uh, with how you plan on raising your children? That's very touch and go. Um, it, it obviously took me years for my wife and I to really establish a really good line of communication on mental health and, and how to really communicate. Um, you know, for years I did what probably a lot of people do is, is I, I blanketed my, my mental health. If I was depressed or anxious, I would say I was tired. I would say it was a long day. Uh, but, you know, being able to say, you know, what, I'm sad. Being able to say, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling a lot of anxiety. You know, I was owning it and, and being able to talk to my wife like that and have her understand and be my soundboard, like that was the first obstacle, which, you know, I, I really believe we accomplished. And then for my children, you know, my, my oldest is 11. Um, and that, that, that will be a very difficult conversation as we, you know, cross that bridge in a few more years to really be honest with the fact that, you know, daddy was suicidal, but you saved him. So it, it's one of those that, you know, I really plan on, on teaching her that life can be hard, but there's nothing you can't get through with family, with support, and with a strong mind. And I've learned so many lessons that I know I will be able to impart on her how to, how to self-talk, 
you know, all these different self-care rituals that she can implement in her life. Um, and really it's, it's to start that conversation on just how do you feel and, and really being open with my daughter on mental health and PTSD, because she knows, you know, dad helps people dad has PTSD or had PTSD. And she really doesn't understand what that means, but there will come a time that I will be fully transparent with her because I wear it as a badge of honor. You know, I see my PTSD and my experience as a true gift because it really forced me and challenged me and allowed me the opportunity to level up in life because I wasn't this person before PTSD. I wasn't this person during. I didn't speak like this. I didn't think like this. This allowed me that option to, to really see that collateral beauty in life. Because if you know how dark life can possibly get, and when you're you know, on that metaphorical bridge ready to jump when life is just too hard, and you know you've stepped off and build yourself back up, and now you're the father and the husband and the police officer you want to be, that is a message that I'm going to preach to them until and until they tell me to shut up, which they do, so, they do sometimes with my preaching. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're doing great. Um, I, could, I couldn't be more grateful. Uh, one that you're doing as well as you're doing, uh, you know, and it's, you know, not that uh, we've had a lot of reasons to connect over the last 20 years, but when, you know, you see somebody you feel even uh, the smallest connection with, um, you see them out of the blue and, and how far they've come. Um, how low things were and then how you're doing now. It, it is uplifting. It's inspiring. And uh, thanks for taking the time to do this. And again, um, I can't thank you enough just for the honesty because uh, we do hear stories sometimes where um, maybe it's PG or, you know, there's a couple redacted uh, moments in it. And I do think it's important that the lady out there like you are, and uh, we really appreciate it and all the best. I, I can't thank you enough for being here and it was so great to see you and just thank you for allowing me to share my story in hopes that, you know, it'll touch a few more people. Yeah.